Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. In 1868, Minnesota voters were the first in the nation to grant black men the right to vote. The Minnesotans of the post-Civil War United States were leaders in the fight for freedom for African Americans, a tradition and spirit that carried on into the 1960s with civil rights leaders from the state such as Roy Wilkins and Hubert H. Humphrey. But even as Minnesota continued to pave the way for civil rights, black men and women were granted little opportunity to achieve true equality. Continued economic and social oppression ensured an ongoing struggle for Minnesota's black population. In his new book, Degrees of Freedom, The Origins of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1912, Augsburg College professor William D. Green depicts the early black experience from the barbers who served Minnesota's elite to the lawyers who helped bird the NAACP and how African Americans had to navigate a culture of Minnesota nice. William D. Green is a professor of history at Augsburg College and he has a new book out on the University of Minnesota Press titled Degrees of Freedom, the Origins of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1912. Professor Green, welcome to Access Minnesota. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Why did you choose to focus on the years 1865 to 1912? Well, uh, originally I, I saw this book as a, a sequel to a book that I published a couple years ago, which ended in 1869. Um, and I wanted to cover the last half of the 19th century to explore uh, the origins of civil rights and to try to get a sense, to get some insight into why Minnesota, of all states, had this very rich history of civil rights, uh, African Americans. Uh, where did that come from? Uh, so in a sense, this, the, the, the time period was just sort of the logical progression of, of, of my study, of uh, trying to get a sense into the personality of the, of the state. In the first chapter of the book, you introduce a man named Jim Thompson. Tell us about him and why did you choose to start the book with his story? Well, uh, he, he's, uh, he's a very, his story is very, very interesting in the sense that he was born into slavery. I saw him as a person whose life filled, you know, kind of ex experienced the full arc of what an African American could experience in, in, a, in a changing society. He came to Minnesota as a slave. Uh, he was born on the plantation owned by the nephew of President James Monroe, so there's a little kind of touch with history. He came to Minnesota as a slave at Fort Snelling. Um, the relationship that he had with his, office, with, his, with his master, who was an officer at the fort, was such that because they were not in the deep south, Jim was afforded certain, certain liberties, and so he actually got a chance to learn the woods and to make relations with, with the Dakota and to actually marry the daughter of, of the chief. Um, this is a very uncharacteristic uh, license that a master would otherwise give to their slave and, and that was very unique to Minnesota in a sense. Um, he would eventually go free in 1837. He would be purchased and then freed by his master, Alfred Brunson, a missionary. and. Um, he would begin to become a part of the, of the Métis and the French-Canadian community. Um, so even though he was from the, the East for all intents and purposes, where black and white were very distinct, because of the nature of the frontier, where, 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 where cultures and races intermingled, he was able to sort of become a part of a of a different community that, that, that seemed to view people in terms of character rather than of culture, uh, rather than color. Um, there are a couple examples that I give in this book where uh, he was actually viewed as a citizen of St. Paul, which is to say that something drastic was happening and the neighbors came to him for help. Uh, he was actually called in to, to testify, which was against territorial law but this was the frontier where the rules are going to be bent, where the lines are going to be blurred. 
and he was able to participate in that. He was able to acquire property. He had only been a slave, out of slavery for a decade, and he's already a man of property with next-door neighbors who included people like Alexander Ramsey and August Larpenter and all the big names of early Minnesota. These were his neighbors and his friends. Um, the paradox of his experience is that as, a, as Minnesota becomes more identified with the American imprint, as more Americans begin to move in from the north and midwestern states and, from some, and some from the southern states, his rights, his status in society begins to decrease. So as long as he's on the frontier, his, he, he seemed to be a fully accepted free man, a man worthy of respect, a man worthy of, of, of respect for his dignity. But as, as Minnesota became more Americanized, um, that, that status began to diminish uh, to the point where by uh, the beginning of the second half, by the 1870s, 1880s, uh, his fortunes are, are all but gone and he's, he's basically relegated to labor status. So I saw in his life a full arc of what was possible for a black man in mid-19th century America and in mid-19th century Minnesota in particular. Your book is divided into three parts, the barbers, the entrepreneurs, and the radicals. How do these three sections represent black experiences during that time? Well, the barbers um, at that time reflected a profession, uh, black men who um, were able to truly beat the odds. Uh, the barbering trade was the only way, for the most part, that African American men could uh, gain status, economic status, uh, acquire property. Uh, make contacts with the, the, the power elite. The paradox of that is that um, barbers were not highly respected. They were not respected by general society, but they were not also respected by leaders of the, the, uh, the black leaders of the abolition movement. Frederick Douglass is one of the most noted critics of barbers because he saw barbers as people who were always obsequious, that they had to play that servile role in order to attract uh, the clientele that they, that they needed in order to become wealthy, um, that they were willing to compromise themselves. Um, and so, you know, they, the, the barbers sort of played an interesting sort of paradox. And in one sense, they reflected uh, the transition that was occurring uh, in the area of leadership for civil rights. You're starting with a person who is able to make contacts with the power elite, but in order to do so, they have to be a person who is inoffensive, who is a good sense of humor, who uh, is, is able to create a commodious environment so that he's not drawing attention to himself. Um, a person who is very cautious in making too many demands. Um, you move from that person to an individual who is an entrepreneur um, whose clientele will include um, um, uh, blacks but also whites as well um, and that his principal interest as an entrepreneur uh, is one who's more interested in um, social and economic development as opposed to political development. Um, the whole issue of social integration is something that they're disinclined to want to pursue. And that is very much reflective of the time in America where um, civil rights only meant political rights. So it was more of a focus on, on developing um, social tastes that seem middle class, more Victorian. Um, it, there seemed to be much more of an effort to to present a picture of African Americans in a positive light so as to vindicate the work of the Republican Party who had been the champions of black rights. Um, but not so much pursue a political agenda per se. Um, though they were political people, this was oftentimes a very tactical move on their part, but uh, it reflected the times of laissez-faireism where business was, where the, the interests of business um, was, was, was really the one that's guiding 
our social um, uh, agenda in the society in general. And at the end where you see the, 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 the race men becoming attorneys, by definition an attorney is one who um, confronts, is, is aggressive, it takes issues, he's, he's an adversary, he's an advocate. Um, not all attorneys played that role with regard to civil rights, but you did find attorneys playing a much more active role, uh, whether directly or indirectly, in establishing laws to protect the social equality agenda, um, to, to discourage discrimination, and to participate in a growing national civil rights movement. The attorneys played a role in that as well. So um, those three um, types of uh, professions uh, you know, I think illustrate the, the, the gradations of civil rights as it evolved over the second half of the 19th century. When Access Minnesota continues, Professor Bill Green discusses Minnesota's connection to the beginnings of the NAACP. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Now back to our conversation with author Bill Green on his book, Degrees of Freedom. Tell us about the birth of the NAACP and some of that organization's connections to the civil rights leaders here in Minnesota. One of the principal attorneys in Minnesota, in St. Paul, African American, Frederick McGee, uh, was counsel to an organization that Booker T. Washington organized and ran. Um, and uh, they would have, that organization would have national conventions uh, in different cities. McGee got the convention to be held in St. Paul. The cover of the book is a, is a photograph of the delegates who included Du Bois and Ida B. Wells and uh, Frederick McGee and Booker T. Washington and others. And it's taken on the steps of the state capitol, which is kind of interesting. Um, the, the legislators and the governor of the state made uh, accommodations available for this black leadership to meet and discuss uh, a new agenda for civil rights. Du Bois would come to uh, St. Paul, come to Minnesota to raise funds for his college. And he developed a friendship with the attorney, Frederick McGee, who worked for, for Booker T. Washington. But McGee was also becoming much more disenchanted with, with Washington. Uh, so Du Bois would stay at, at, at McGee's house, in part because they were common spirits. They, they were kindred spirits, in effect. During one such visit, McGee suggested to Du Bois, why don't we call people together and hold a meeting and really organize ourselves? Um, and this would become the idea that would spawn uh, the Niagara Movement, which in turn would become a predecessor of the NAACP. It all began in St. Paul. Tell us about the research process for this book. Was it difficult to find sources that depicted the lives of people who were minorities as well as oppressed? Yes, it, it was. Um, and it kind of goes to understanding, for me, understanding the, the mythology that existed because there was a sense of self-satisfaction that the, the opinion makers and the political and business elite of Minnesota had of themselves. We, had, we did not have a race problem. And the reason why we know we don't have a race problem is, number one, we're not lynching blacks. That's a clear indicator. And two, all of the stories that we read in the papers that we own are positive stories for the most part. And three, the blacks, we can see black people who dress like us, who have similar st uh, tastes that we have, and they tell us everything is fine. So there was this, this, this belief that things were, were much better uh, and, and a willingness to accept that because I have a feeling that they kind of knew that that their black friends weren't totally candid with them. I think that looking at this, this research, one has to be able to look between the lines. Um, this was not a place and time when candor was a good thing. 
So what, what I learned to do in doing this research was not only look at what people said, but to look at what people did. Um, to, to, to look at the consequence of certain actions that would oftentimes run counter to what people said they wanted to do. Uh, when, I, when I was young, there was a, um, I don't know even what it's called, but it was sort of a picture that was under a plastic screen that was gridded. And if you look at it a certain way or twist, twist it a certain way, you get a different, different image. Um, this is, in effect, what, what we're talking about when doing this type of history. Uh, it was a great thing when the black press was created. Um, it was during those early months when the black press was stridently stating its case and describing life as, as people saw it. They were speaking for themselves. They weren't having to negotiate with white editors and white newspapers. Um, having, having the story filtered through that lens. They could be candid in their newspaper. It's a tricky thing uh, knowing whether what you see is what is actually there. And so um, in, in, in trying to divine the history, I really had to develop a certain kind of patience that I would not normally do or show or, or feel in other other kinds of research where the, 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 the history is pretty well trodden and, and explained and, and, and laid out. Minnesota history required a lot of effort to, to, to figure out what, what is there, what, what, what am I actually seeing as opposed to what is, what is it being presented, how is it being presented. Um, letters, newspapers, speeches, um, those are the kinds of things that play a a key role for any historian doing research. Um, but then the issue of interpretation requires uh, looking at the consequence of an action as well as the action itself uh, and piecing together the humanity. How would I feel in this particular situation? Even in the early stages of statehood, a culture of Minnesota nice had already taken hold. When Access Minnesota returns, Author Bill Green discusses the role Minnesota Nice played in early black and white relations. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Here's more of our conversation with Augsburg College professor Bill Green about his new book, Degrees of Freedom, The Origins of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1912. You mentioned in your book the concept of Minnesota nice. What does that term mean to you, and how did the state's niceness play a role in race relations? Minnesotans had a reason to feel good about themselves with regard to race, especially for African Americans. Um, this was the state that, 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 that extended voting rights to black men. And no other state had ever done that by popular vote. I mean, nobody else had ever done that before. Um, and that, that, that right was established before the 15th Amendment had been ratified. This was also a state that banned school segregation on principle, just on principle. Um, this was a state that um, included blacks on juries. This was a state that seemed to create a, a, a tone where um, the, the, the racial instance that we, we, we associate with the South and parts of the North during the second half of the 19th century, it, it wasn't played out in Minnesota. Uh, so those are things that, 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 that white Minnesota had reason to feel good about, you know, feel superior about in a sense. And it was a reason for African Americans to, to a large extent to feel a sense of gratitude. But gratitude also gets in the way of moving things for, forward. It allows people to say, well, we've done this for you. You don't have a right to ask for more. In the introduction to Degrees of Freedom, you begin with the story of a speech that Frederick Douglass gave in St. Paul to an enthusiastic crowd in 1873. Afterwards, a supporter offered Douglass a room in his hotel, but Douglass was denied because the hotel did not allow blacks to stay there. Of this instance, you wrote, quote, For many of his ilk, 
freedom only seemed to mean being unshackled from chains of servitude, not having the means to pursue the full enjoyment of opportunity." Close quote. Can you talk about the difference between freedom and opportunity? Freedom uh, in this context was the freedom to vote, the freedom to, to exercise uh, civic and political uh, um, participation in, in government. But opportunity is uh, really the, 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 the chance to develop skills uh, for jobs, um, the chance to be able to uh, purchase a farm. Not that the farm is handed to someone or that a job is handed to someone, but the, the opportunity to acquire the skills to be able to compete for that, uh, for those jobs, is what opportunity is about. Um, with regard to, this was still an agricultural state and African Americans moving into the state f up until maybe the 1880s, 1890s, um, were still farm folk. If you have the money and the, and the owner of a farm doesn't want to sell it to you because of your race, you don't really have opportunity. You still have the right to vote. But the opportunity to be able to make something of yourself had been denied because um, that person who could provide the opportunity was not a government official and it wasn't something that was the result of the ballot. Uh, a person selling land, for example, could choose not to make it available to you. A person who had the abilities to teach you a skill for skilled labor could choose not to take you on as an apprentice. Uh, even if a person had skills, the employer could choose not to hire you for whatever reasons. That's the kind of thing that made the difference between opportunity and, and civil rights. Let's talk about that frequent disconnect between freedom and opportunity. Yeah. Are remnants of that still in existence today in Minnesota, in your viewpoint? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I used to be in education, uh, K-12 education. And, um, but you know, one doesn't have to be in a Minneapolis to see this across the country, this incredible achievement gap, kids of color and, and, and white kids, but it's not just education, although it starts with that. A child is not educated, so they could grow into an adult with education. They're not gonna be able to compete for jobs. Um, so there's, a, there's an employment gap. Um, if you don't have enough earning power, uh, and provide it, you can oversee real estate, uh, realtor practices, uh, you, can, you can buy a house, but, but in the absence of any kind of lucrative or ability to earn steady income and receive a loan from the bank, the discrimination the banks had, 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 had exhibited over the past 20, 30 years to deny African Americans a loan and Latino Americans a loan, that's a denial of opportunity, even though those applicants had money uh, to pay for, for a house. Um, jobs, uh, housing, education, all of these, the, the, the gap is there. It's been there for, 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 for several decades now. And yet, at the same time, African Americans can vote. Uh, they, they, they can serve on juries. Um, the, the, the impact of, of uh, how we police our cities, for example, has a disparate impact on African Americans and people of poverty. Um, they can vote. They can all vote, um, serve on juries. They can all uh, participate in, in the civic arena. But in the world once they, that they enter, once they leave the ballot box, uh, is, is very different. It still sees color first. And um, so uh, the issue of opportunity remains elusive. Um, it's, it's, it, it's different now than in the past in the sense that we have the language to describe what opportunity means and when opportunity is denied. We have the language to describe it but we're living in a society that seems to um, be complacent to, to that problem, that, that if we have not been able to resolve it now, you know, that's a fact of life that we have to live with, 
and none of us can really afford to, 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 to create a society that makes those kinds of uh, opportunities possible. William D. Green is a professor of history at Augsburg College. He has a new book out on the University of Minnesota Press titled Degrees of Freedom, the Origins of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1912. Professor Green, thanks so much for joining us on Access Minnesota. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. That's all for this month's edition of Access Minnesota. We'll see you again next month. Thanks for watching. Access Minnesota issues that matter to you. Join us again next week as we bring you the newsmakers and stories that shape our everyday lives. Access Minnesota is produced by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association in cooperation with the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts.